it's always just a great opportunity to show off what's going on. So again, I'd like to thank all of our performers today. Enjoy your pizza. You've done a phenomenal job. But if I run short on time, I may call you back out to help me out a little bit. Um, the other plug I want to, oh, thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs> Talked about the art around the room. OK, I'm going to give a plug for this. As you leave today, if you haven't already, take a look at the art. This is local art by students in our school districts as well as our staff members. What a great opportunity to adorn an office or a home with a piece of artwork that supports our arts program. So please take a moment before you leave. Check it out. It's all going to a great cause. And again, another opportunity for you to see how talented our kids are. Before I begin, I would like to thank two people who made the arts portion of our day possible today. Katie Anderson, wave in the back. Katie Anderson is our arts coordinator, does a phenomenal job. And also, Shelly Patrick, if you're still here, thank you so much for setting up today. We rely on these folks to support our arts programs and really help our kids um, get out in front of this community. But I'm going to get started. Um, our mission is to engage, inspire, and prepare. I hope the performances that you saw today um, were inspirational to you as they were to me. But really what we want kids in our classrooms to do is live those three words of being engaged in instruction, inspired by what's happening around them, the others, but ultimately with that goal of being prepared for the future. And our vision, of course, is to prepare all students for success today and tomorrow. And our presentation will address that today. But one of the great things about events like this, and thank you to the chamber, is I'm literally surrounded by partners of the Paulding County School District, District, Shaw Hankins, RKR Construction, all the civic and community leaders who coordinate with us, civic organizations like the Rotary Club of Dallas, Greystone, our power mm. partners, are all here. And you're going to see them throughout this presentation because they truly are part of this community. And we can't do our job without them and you. So thank you to our community. Just a little bit about our school district. Um, many of you have heard this many times before, 33 schools, 19 elementary schools, 9 middle schools, 5 high schools, and one alternative education center that also houses our virtual academy and currently under construction our college and career academy. We have nearly 30,000 students in the Paulding County School District. We are the 13th largest district in the state of Georgia. And I keep saying that to everyone to let us know we're not little old Paulding County. We are the 13th largest school district in the state of Georgia. We have a very diverse student population. 59% uh, of our students are white, 25% black, 10% Hispanic, and then 5% multi-ethnic. So we have a growingly diverse community that we embrace and appreciate. We have a great community to live in. We have great students that we work with on an everyday, everyday basis, and it's really a joy to come into work every day. But from an economic development standpoint, we're also the single largest employer in the Paulding County. We have 3,400 employees. That's approximately 1,800 teachers and all the support staff that it takes to really support and provide the educational opportunities that our students need. But none of that would be possible without our Board of Education. And I'd personally like to thank our board. Several of them are here today. Mr. Jeff Fuller, who's our board chair. Ms. Kim Cobb, who's our vice chair. Also, Mr. John Dean, District 5. But our other board members, Ms. Teresa Lyons, Mr. Nick Chester, Mr. Glenn Albright, and more, of course, Mr. Jason Anavitardi. They have a heart for kids. You don't become a Board of Education member unless you care about the kids of this community. And I'd like to personally thank them for their support of our district and this community. We would not be able to do the things we do for kids without their support. I want to start with some good news. Uh, accreditation is important to many of your organizations. I know you have outside eyes that come in and they take a look and they validate what you do on a daily basis. But this October, we had an accreditation visit. Um, we have to receive accreditation every five years, and we had that team visit occur this year. Um, part of that visit was they look at our data. They look at all the documentation we provide to the standards that we have to align to as a school district, these best practices. But on top of that, they interviewed a lot of you here in this room. And I want to share with you those results. Well, first, I want to tell you what they look for. They're going to look at our district practices, or they did look at our district practices. Um, and they compare those to research-based practices and standards. They're going to look at the entire institution, everything that we do for kids based on those standards. They're going to provide us feedback based on those standards because there's no organization that can't grow. There's not one of us that heads a company or works in a nonprofit that doesn't have room for growth. They're going to work with us on that. But they also want to make sure we're in that cycle of continuous improvement. They're always looking at what we're doing and how we can do that better. On top of that, 
They're going to look at things like leadership capacity, our resources, as well as our learning capacity for our students. So that's the umbrella. They spend several days in the district. They visited multiple schools, visited classrooms that your kids may have been in, learning on a particular day. Well, let me tell you how they categorize us on each of the standards. So they're going to look at each one of those, and they're going to say, you're kind of here, all right? You're, you're not where you need to be, or you're doing great here. And those categories are at an initiation level. And they're telling you if you have a standard in that area, you need to look at this. There's something that you need to do. There's not something that you're offering your students. There's an improved category, which is saying basically, hey, you're doing good stuff, but you still need to look at it. You need to monitor your results, make sure you're getting the results you desire, but continue looking at it. And then there's impact level uh, performance, and that is where the district should continue to support and sustain the practices that are yielding results. Oh, that slide right there. Well, I kind of ruined the whole surprise there. <laughs> but 90.3% of the standards we were evaluated against were at the impact level. So for a district our size, thank you. <laughs> it shows you the level of commitment that we have to our students and the programs that we offer. We had 9.7% of those standards with that improved level. You know, you need to continue an analysis, an analysis of what's going on. And every district knows across the state there's things that you have to continue because you can't be satisfied until you're meeting every kid's needs. But the most exciting part was there were zero standards in the initiate level. That means they found nothing in this particular study that said, hey, this is an area that is just a void. There's a vacuum here. You're not doing what you need to do. So I want to thank all of you who participated in that process. But no, we're committed to providing the very best educational experiences for your kids. Next, I want to share just a little bit of data with you. Um, of course, we're about to hit testing season. For those of you who have kids, uh, you know it's that time of year when the milestones are rolling around. You're having your high school students taking their end of grade assessments. Um, but really, if you look at us very globally here, um, this is comparing us to the state. The hatch line is state performance on milestones in grades three through eight, and we're the solid color bars. You can see that we're outperforming the state. But that's not the metric that we want to be living on. Our goal is to continue to improve upon what we're doing each and every day, making sure our students have those fundamental skills they need to be successful in school, but also hopefully one day when they're coming to your business and you're needing an employee to fill a need, that they can fill that for you. When we look at our graduation rates, we are the blue line. Um, our district has continued to see increase in our graduation rates. We're very excited about that, again, but we're not at 100%. And until you can say you have 100% graduation rate, you know that you have work to do. But what we want to do is align students with opportunities, give them the content, the instruction, and the experience they need to graduate from high school, because that's a key indicator of success in the future. Um, but again, you'll see that we're nearly exceeding the state by 5% in graduation rates. So we have some good things going on, always areas for improvement. Well, how do you do that? Um, we have specific steps for improvement, and a lot of them focus around literacy, fundamental literacy. Um, we talked about it last year, and I'll have some updates for you in this presentation. But we know kids need to be able to read and write effectively. Um, that is a key fundamental right and need of every kid. Um, there was data shared, I believe, at a chamber meeting, and, and I think I shared it last year as well. One of the key metrics um, our government uses to determine the number of jail cells a community needs is third grade literacy rates. So we know there's a sense of urgency around literacy, and we put programs in place to support kids. We also know we need to use data. Business does it every day. We need to use data in order to inform our practices as a district. When the data is not indicative of the results we desire, then we need to be looking at it and identifying ways that we can improve. Um, on top of that, we realize the opportunities that STEM and STEAM offer our students. Um, as a matter of fact, I was talking to the folks from Carroll EMC who provided some grants at South Potting High School. Mr. Dean and I were there yesterday walking around in a the swamp. They actually have a habitat they're studying. They're gathering pH levels. They're using the data they gather in the swamp in their statistics class in order to analyze that type of data. So we want to provide our kids relevant experiences that really can connect them to the content they're learning in the classroom. So partners, though, again, 
a lot of the work they're doing was because there are great opportunities out there that are provided by our partners. I want to thank all of you for what you do for us. Uh, but STEM and STEAM, of course, is a huge area of focus. And also the whole idea of advisement. Um, been in a school district my whole life. All I've ever done is gone to school and go to school. Had a little stint at Kmart in high school and college. But other than that, I was pretty much, you know, a school guy. That's what I did. But still, preparing that path for your kid when it's time for them to graduate, making sure they have the courses they need, making sure that they have everything they not only need to graduate, but maybe that career interest they may have. So we really want to hone in on how we can better support our parents and our students in creating that track for graduation and engagement in school. Um, talk a little bit about literacy. Um, you know, you say, why literacy? You know, yeah, every kid needs to learn to read. I did it when I was in first grade. Well, that's not the case. Literacy is critically important. So when you think about literacy, it's a major antidote to poverty. It gives choices in work and personal lives, leading to greater freedom. You know, if a kid's restricted in what they can read, they're restricted in what they can do in a career. They're restricted in how they can achieve. Also, it helps teach people how to think. And I'll tell you, one of the most challenging things to do as an educator is to teach a kid how to think working them through the process of how this all happens. Um, and when you see it in the classroom, and it's an amazing thing when the light bulb goes on, but teaching kids to think critically is also a key component of literacy. But really, and I love this quote, it's the currency for other learning. There is not a class a kid in the Paulding County School District will go into where they don't need to know how to read and write. I don't care if it's AP Calculus, AP Environmental Science, it all requires reading. And as a matter of fact, the rigor of that reading is higher, um, uh, is an extremely high level. So we need to have them to be able to read on a technical level. But ultimately, it leads to a better quality of life for our kids, and that's what we want. Um, and that's why we're focusing on literacy. So last year, I told you the great news, we got a $4.5 million grant, the largest award in the state of Georgia last year. But the continuation of that great news is that money is being utilized in classrooms and we're getting good and great results with our kids. Um, this grant provided for us to work with two pre-K centers here in Paulding County, because this is truly a cradle to graduation initiative um, uh, for the state as well as for this district. We work in 11 elementary schools providing these additional resources, five middle schools, and two high schools. So really this grant is to provide two feeder patterns, which are the South Paulding High School and Hiram High School feeder patterns, additional supports in the area of literacy. We selected those areas based on the data we saw. We identified these as the schools where we can make the most impact with these dollars. But what are we doing there? We're improving student foundational liter literacy as well as content and disciplinary literacy. So disciplinary literacy is what you're reading within that discipline. When you go in a science class and you're reading about a particular topic, so we wanna enhance that. We're increasing the professional capacity of our staff. Because I'll be honest with you, it's not easy to teach a kid how to read. I taught eighth grade. Most of my kids, when I was at Herschel Jones Middle School in 1990, knew how to read when they came into my classroom. But I will tell you, and I won't mention their names because they probably still, some of them live here, I knew the kids that didn't know how to read. Because they were the ones who in the corner when it was time for us to read aloud, do y'all remember the fear of being called on to read aloud? Just the look on their face. So we can't forget those kids too. If they're at a point right now where they need that additional literacy support, we need to provide that for them. And that is through our teachers having the strategies to teach those kids. Um, we also want to uh, include the community. As a matter of fact, and Bonnie, I'm going to give you a shout out to the crowd. Do you know the date of our literacy? Um, it's in late March. We'll, we'll make sure it's out on our website. We're having a, a community literacy night that we want to get you guys out and engaged. Um, with us in this process, because all of us working together can get these things done. But also, we want to get that literacy focus from cradle to college. We want to get the kids, and I had someone tell me one time, we would love it if every kid came in like a perfectly shaped round ball, but they don't. We got squares, we got rectangles, we got hexagons, we got octagons. Everyone comes in with a different experience from their home. We want to be able to be part of initiatives that get those kids ready before they hit kindergarten. Another bit of good news we've been talking about here for years, right? Paulding College and Career Academy. Well, we are currently in, RK Reading is in the process of renovating uh, that, uh, 
that uh, building. It looks phenomenal. We're excited about it. Uh, the great news is it's opening next year. The really great news is we already have 142 students who have registered for the Paulding College and Career Academy. That was well beyond our expectations. I want to remind you again of what the pathways are at the Paulding College and Career Academy. They are energy, which is linemen and technician skills. And again, thank you to our power partners for being at the table with us in developing these pathways. IT, which is cybersecurity, healthcare, which is CNA patient care tech. So if you get a CNA certificate, that means you can basically go out Wellstar, right? And you can be working in that field as a graduate. That is by far has the most respondents actually in terms of interest in this program, as well as manufacturing with mechatronics, which is robotics. So Mayoris and everyone here who has done so much to get this thing from an idea to an actual building that will be ready for students next year, thank you. We're terribly excited about it. Um, we'll actually finish construction probably sometime this spring. Um, we're ready to have everybody out for a grand opening and show off our new facility. Got to share new stuff with you too though. We currently have a magnet program at Paulding County High School in biomedical. Uh, we are in the process because of a GOSA grant, which is the Governor's Office of Student Achievement. Um, we are in the process of planning a Academy of Computer Science and Technology at Hiram High School. Now, what does this mean? This means that kids who have a real interest and meet enrollment criteria can go in a program designed around computer science. So when we look at initiatives to support the community, we want to identify skills that translate to multiple um, businesses, because who doesn't need IT help? Who does not need computer science help in any organization? Uh, we recently had a trip where several of our team, uh, Jana and others, went to see what a really high-functioning school of this nature looks like. Um, that's part of our planning process. We want to offer a product that kids want to go and learn more in. We're really excited about that, and really we're looking at an opening of the 220-221 school year for this. Um, so this opportunity, again, is for a kid anywhere in the county, if you meet the criteria, you can come and focus on computer science. We're really excited about it. The other part uh, that we're looking at also is what we're doing in middle schools, and this will actually be part of the next phase of this grant, is how do we support our middle schools with IT, STEM, and tech? I know I'm going fast. I think I'm still pretty close on time. Um, the other issue we've dealt with as a district is growth. You're the business community. You know what's happening here. You see it happening. Um, and our growth trends, you can see, have continued to rise. Um, we're seeing new homes being constructed, particularly in the north end of the community. And we want to be on the front end of managing that growth from a district side. So again, you can see the enrollment increasing. And here are some relatively scary numbers. These are projections. These are 10-year projections, OK? Um, this is all on our website as well. So if you have interest planning for the future, um, it's on our website. You can see all this. But based on current growth trends, and again, 10 years, you're getting a little way out. So you know these are projections. But we could be in a situation that North Paulding High School would be almost 1,200 kids over um, the capacity of that school. Looking at uh, East Paulding, high school with approximately 300 kids over their current capacity. And then what we are seeing, though, is we're not seeing the growth in the south end of the county. Um, now, again, a 10-year projection, a lot could change in that time, but we've got to be on top of that, continuing to monitor it. So one of the initiatives that we wanted to take on this year was actually getting out and talking to our community. Um, we hosted five, basically, forums on growth, and the objective of those was to provide information to our community about growth, growth, but also get feedback from our community. Um, and I want to share a brief summary of some of the major pieces that we pulled out of our growth conversations. So really, what we learned is we had engagement countywide, but more people came where the growth currently is. We had a large crowd at North Paulding, a pretty good sized crowd at East Paulding, but as we got into different parts of the community that weren't as closely impacted by growth, we didn't see the numbers there. Um, basically, we asked them, how would you manage this growth? What kind of thoughts do you have? And really, a general trend was it's either building new schools or adding on to existing schools was really kind of the preferred approach of dealing with growth. Um, they also mentioned several times, as you know, we own two pieces of property 
on the Seven Hills connector, utilizing that space to absorb and deal with growth. But really, like having experienced this many times when you talk about change and redistricting, folks said that they would prefer to minimize redistricting and preserve the feeder patterns and the relationships with their schools they have. Now, we know when growth happens, you can't build a school and not redistrict and put no one in it. That doesn't really make sense, does it? What I think the community said was be smart about it. You know, let's try to preserve our feeder patterns as best we can, but knowing that change has to happen when your building can only hold so many people. Um, but also, one of the things that actually we already in the hopper was reflected in those meetings, which is to bolster under capacity schools with academic programs like magnets. Because currently right now, Hiram High School has our lowest high school enrollment. So I just shared with you one of our approaches is, let's build a program that students would want to come to at that school. And it also alleviates crowding at the schools that we're sending those kids from. Um, so again, I know I'm going fast, um, but want to share a couple things that are new this year. That uh, last year was probably one of the most challenging years that I have seen as an educator, and I think most of us would agree. The issue of safety um, dominated last year's conversation. Um, and I want to thank our board again for providing the funding we needed to put initiatives in place at our schools. One is we have a district safety officer, his name is Mike Ruppel. Um, we were able to get Mike. Mike actually has not only National Homeland Security experience, but also a GEMA experience. So he is actually an armed officer of the school district. He does a number of jobs for us, including doing uh, safety assessments at each of our schools and supporting us in times of need. Um, this little thing right here that you see in the picture is an access control unit. So parents coming online, if it hasn't already to your school, we're going to ask you to buzz into the building before we allow you in the front doors. So please be patient and know the reason we're doing that is to protect you and your children. So these are coming online a school at a time. We're getting close to half of our schools having these in place, but this is an access control unit. We have a camera inside the building that will see you. We'll ask for ID before we allow you into the building. We also would like to thank our sheriff's department who are continually partnering with us on a daily basis. We've added additional SROs at the elementary school. and We're continuing to work with that program. Also additional facility improvements, and I'll just say it again, uh, the greatest partner we have, or partners we have in this district, are, is our law enforcement and emergency responding community. And I'd like to give them, ask you to give them a round of applause right now, because I know some of them are here. Great partnerships. Real quickly, I'm coming to a close, but one of the other things that I think has been a huge trend in education as well as recognizing the impact of mental health. So here are a few stats I wanna share with you. 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness occur before the age of 14. 37% of students 14 and under, uh, 14 and older with mental illness drop out of school. Students who feel connected have higher grades and test scores. And you know that, when your kid's engaged in school, they wanna be there, all those other things happen. The grades come, the participation comes. But mental illness is a challenge that not only school district faces, but a community faces. So what have we done as a district and where are we going? One is we actually created, created the position of prevention intervention specialist. And this is a person in our office who provides training to schools on issues like suicide prevention. They help us with our own staff. Um, but recognizing that whatever we can do to support kids in our schools around this topic is creating safer and more climate rich schools for our students. But we're also looking at evidence-based programs. Again, these are research-based programs to support our students um, and foster better relationships and connectedness and support. Um, if I could bring a ton of people up here, we have an initiative going on in some of our schools called Capturing Kids Hearts. And it's truly about connecting with the staff. Because you know when you had that teacher, and I have my fifth grade teachers actually on my screensaver, you have a connection you're gonna do well. We wanna create environments where kids are connecting with, with our, our teachers. But we want to also allow those students who have needs and their counselors to have access to them during the school day. So we've made some policy changes. And also, of course, our continued collaboration with our governmental agencies that support us. As I kind of get down to the very end here, I wanna throw some other facts at you. This blows me away. Trey Studstill, our transportation director is here. 
Last year, transportation drove 14,491 miles each day. That is 2.6 million miles of transporting students. We added Here Comes the Bus app this year. And just by a show of hands, how many of you have that? Does anyone, any of you have Here Come the Bus? So you know where your kid is. It's going to send you a message when they hit that area that you know and you can track where your kids are. And we have 11,300 families who have Here Come the Bus accounts. But those families have multiple children. So we're really reaching a rate of uh, with this where we feel like we're really reaching all of our community with this app. Also, here's another thing that blows me away. Nutrition serves almost 22,000 breakfasts and lunches each day. That's nearly 4 million meals during the school year. And our maintenance department completed almost set, well, 6,600 work orders at our facilities last year. So we have great people. When we talk about those 3,400 employees, that's our bus drivers, our maintenance workers, our cafeteria workers, our technology workers who does, do such a phenomenal job. And lastly, I'll close with this. Um, we have many things to celebrate in the Paulden County School District. We have our Teachers of the Year. We're very proud of our Employees of the Year. We have our 2019 Star Students and Teachers, which this chamber has supported for 60 years, that program. And we have our Special Olympics program. And uh, Angela Camerano Moses is here, wave your hand. She coordinates Special Olympics for this district. We had the Polar Plunge. That event raised $10,000 for the Special Olympics program. Thank you. But I would like to close by saying this. We have all these great things going on, but we couldn't do it without tremendous students, tremendous staff, tremendous parents, and truly just a tremendous community to work in. It is my privilege to work with your children and, and your families each and every day. Our staff, I'd like to thank them. If you're on our staff, please raise your hand. Uh, yeah, you have to, yeah. Uh, our job is to support your kids. So, I was pretty close, John. I was pretty close. But uh, as I depart again, uh, please take a look before you leave. The arts are so critical to our students. You heard the band. You heard a beautiful solo. Um, but we have artists in this community uh, that are students who uh, could really benefit from your support. So thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to work with your families. Mm -hmm.